Welcome to Forcing Function Hour, a conversation series exploring the boundaries of peak performance. Join me, Chris Sparks, as I interview elite performers to reveal principles, systems, and strategies for achieving your competitive edge in business. If you're an executive or an investor ready to take yourself to the next level, download my workbook at experimentwithoutlimits.com. For all episodes and show notes, go to forcingfunctionhour.com. Hello from Berlin. Today, I am so excited to be joined by Kristen Allen. Kristen Allen is a two-time world champion in the sport of acrobatic gymnastics and a member of the USA Gymnastics Hall of Fame. After leaving competitive sport, Kristen performed on Broadway, performed with Cirque du Soleil, and the Kellogg's Tour of Champions. Today, Kristen is the founder and president of the Acrobatic Gymnastics Foundation, the chairwoman of the National Gymnastics Foundation, and an active investor and advisor in early stage companies. In this conversation, we are going to deconstruct peak performance. We'll dig into the mindset, training, and preparation necessary to reach the elite levels of a sport. We'll also discuss some lesser known aspects of reaching the top, namely, what comes next? Entangling our identities from our chosen profession and creating practices for positive mental health and recovery. Thank you so much for joining me, Kristen. I've been really looking forward to this. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here. I really appreciate you having me on. So talk to us about acrobatic gymnastics. What do you love so much about the sport? Uh, acrobatic gymnastics, I think, combines a lot of unique aspects of sport. You get the dance aspect, you get the team aspect, uh, as well as strength and flips and danger. Um, so uh, I think it really um, gives you a lot to work with, which makes it really fun. Um, I, and I think probably the best way to describe the sport is it's really similar to pair figure skating. So you have, I had a male partner who would throw me, we do flips, handstands, all kinds of lifts, and it was choreographed to music. So I think that's the, the best comparison to make. That uh, intersection of performance and athleticism, I think, really makes acro unique. There's this strength, agility, flexibility element, but also you're dancing, you're choreographing a routine, and it's almost some, some acting in there, right? It's very demonstrative. Talk to me about that intersection. Do you, do you see yourself as a natural performer, or was this something that you had to learn along the way? Oh, gosh. Well, I definitely wasn't a natural athlete. Uh, I um, have some very funny videos of myself when I was first starting out um, looking incredibly awkward. So um, <laughs> I, I definitely had to put a lot of hours in to, to get to where I was. Um, but I, I always loved about the sport that it had that performance act. Um, aspect of it. And I think that really led nicely into what I ended up doing post my competitive career. What do you, what do you think makes acrobatic gymnastics different from other areas of athletics, other sports? Was there something in particular that really drew you to it? You know, when you start a sport, when you're really young, I don't know if you necessarily know why you're doing what you're doing, right? I started the sport when I was I uh, like first came across the sport when I was seven and it took me two years to convince my parents to let me join the competitive team. Um, they wanted me to kind of be more broad and, and do lots of different activities. And I was sort of hell bent on, on doing the one thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that I always really loved to dance. So the, the fact that it had that dance element, I think was really, um, my favorite part of it for a long time. I spent more time practicing my dance moves than I did my handstands, uh, much to um, my coach's dismay in the early years. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think that's what I liked. It was the unique combination of things. Was there a moment that you realized how much potential you had? You know, that's a great question. I don't know if there was a specific moment necessarily. I 
just know that I kind of had that fire in me to, to do well. And I, I remember being around 11, probably when I met, um, the current world champions at the time. And I had the opportunity to kind of talk to them. And, and I remember them, one of them telling me that he would sign his journal every day, future world champion. And I think that's the first time I learned what kind of the best thing you could do in the sport was. I mean, I was a little kid, so I, I didn't really understand that um, until that moment, I think. And so I think all I really knew was, okay, this person that I look up to is doing this. And so that's probably what I should do. And so I started, you know, writing in a journal, the same thing and signing it future world champion every day. Seems like it worked out pretty well for you. Uh, <laughs> this fire you describe at this young age, this, this drive to be a future world champion, where do you think that fire comes from? Yeah. So I guess this is where I start to get a little controversial because I think that when you look at the top performers in the world, a lot of them tend to have really difficult childhoods. Um, they tend to have some kind of traumatic experience. And I think that, um, or just maybe a, a sense of feeling less than or unworthy in some way. And I think that that, that is really where that fire comes from. And I know that's not necessarily what is exciting to hear. I think a lot of us want to say, oh, it's, it's, just innate, it's intrinsic, it's grit, it's resilience. Um, but I think those things really come from adverse experiences, unfortunately. And I think for me, it was really a desire to prove myself and kind of have something that no one could take away from me. And we'll touch on motivation later in the conversation, but um, I think that's, as I've kind of unpacked this later on in life, uh, that that's sort of the conclusion I've come to. Um, and I've actually had the opportunity to participate in some research studies around um, top performers. And um, there's one study in particular that USC is running um, that I'm excited for the results. But I think in looking for commonalities atop, uh, through top performers, I think that, uh, that the results are looking fairly similar to, to what I've just said. So. Talk to me about the study. What, what do you expect to come out of it? Well, you know, obviously it's still in process, so I, I'm not sure what the actual results will be, but um, I think it, I think that what will come out of it is, is that commonality that most of the world's top performers tend to have had some early childhood trauma. So this commonality of being resilient to adversity, uh, as you're, you're rising through the levels in gymnastics, what, what types of adversity did you have to face? Well, I think that with elite sport in general, it's sort of, we've normalized a lot of adversity um, that you face. Um, for example, you know, I think especially in a sport like gymnastics and other sports where um, you peak really young, you're exposed to um, some pretty difficult things really young. Um, and, you know, I, I think it could be psychological abuse, it's physical abuse, it could be sexual abuse. Um, but the things that are kind of more normalized are the psychological and physical abuse pieces, which are, you know, you're a, a young child and you're being forcefully stretched um, until you cry or until your, your hip pops out of your socket and you get injured. I mean, or, or you're just yelled at, um, you're criticized about your body, about, um, you know, your level of training um, compared constantly to other people um, that you're training with. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's not even being yelled at, it's just a subtle, um, uh, settled meaning that occurs in the gym. Um, 
from, from the adults in your life. So, um, I think that there are more and more people speaking out about this and understanding, okay, does it have to be this way? Do we have to train athletes, um, to be the, this level and do it in such a damaging way? Um, and I don't, know the answer to that, but I know there are a lot of people doing great work to try to um, solve these problems, which is really encouraging to me so that other athletes don't end up in the same um, situations that I was in. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, it can be it can be a very difficult environment to grow up in. As the world expands, um, you know, we, through the internet, through the world stage, the world becoming flatter, it's so easy to fall into this relativistic trap of, of comparison. Where it's, it's so easy to see all everyone else who seems to be so much further along for us. And it, it can be really really tough to not compare our, where we are to where others are and to feel feel a sense of being an imposter that you know everyone else is, has it has it all together they have it all figured out you, you mentioned this um, this is really you know reinforced in athletics is that you you are especially at the highest levels just exposed to so much intensity and the temptation to compare with everyone around you. Did you have success with I think of this like staying in your own lane and and doing your own thing, having your own performance without you know worrying what everyone else is is doing? Was this you you mentioned your your journaling practice? Was there was there anything that seemed to work for you to you know stay focused on your own goals and your own mission for doing this? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think so. I as far as my journal journaling practice in particular, I would say one thing that I did every night was just write down all of my goals. I had a, a tiny little notebook and I would write every day, every night I would write, I will do whatever the goal was. So I will pass my math test. <laughs> I will, uh, you know, um, do this new trick tomorrow. I will, and at the, the top, it was always, I will be a world champion. So um, that kept me focused on the things that I wanted to accomplish every day. Um, and I did that every night for years. Um, so that was one thing. Another thing is that one thing my dad used to always tell me is that it's important to pass from the competitive mind into the creative mind. And what that sort of meant was instead of thinking about how you're doing in comparison to others, it should just be about how can I be the best for myself? And, um, and what do, what do I want to put out on, on the world stage, I guess. So if I'm competing at worlds, I, I want to, you know, know that that was the best performance of my life for me. Um, and not because, it was better than someone else's. And I think especially in a sport like mine, where it's, there's a, a large creative aspect and a performance aspect that's subjectively judged. It's really, it was incredibly important to think that because people like different types of art. And so uh, one judge might prefer my style of dance and another judge might prefer someone else's. So when it's subjective that way, you really just have to think about, okay, what, what do I love and make sure that that's what I'm putting out in the world. That's a really interesting dimension that I, I think a lot of people don't encounter in sport is that you're, you're judged by someone else. And it's, it's, it's within that word, it's, it's, it's a judgment that this is good. This is the right way of doing it. And imagine with this subjective judging, there's a temptation to try to do something that you think the judges want to see. But I imagine that that leads to a road of doing something that is derivative, that like isn't all that innovative. And I like what you're saying about this is the best performance for me, that this, what I have under control is I can do things my own way, the way that I, that I like to do them. Did you 
did you did you find that this worked better for you than trying to create the routine that the judges would like? How, how do you how do you think about striking this balance? I think it's exactly what you said. It's a balance, right? And I think that that's something that continues on into the rest of my life too. It's it's a balance of okay, how can I optimize for the situation uh, and the environment that I'm in, which would be what the judges want or what the requirements of the sport are, but then also how can I um, bring my own flair to it and um, and do what feels right to me. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways where that come, what, what that comes down to is preparation. So it's, I know that if I've done my best to prepare, then with whatever, in whatever that high pressure situation or environment is, I know I did my best. And so I can always learn more and do better next time. But in that context, I did my best. So I don't have to have any regrets about it or worry about how someone else felt about it. That's great feedback. That's interesting. I can decide to take that or leave that for next time. But I know that I put in the preparation that I needed to, to feel good about what I did that day. I, I can tell you, you've really thought about this and there's a lot of wisdom from, from the years that what other people think is just feedback. It's useful, but mm -hmm. not necessarily something to take to heart. And this is, this, this is something that I return to often that um, all we have in our control is the effort that we put in. So if we give our best effort, if we try our best, we have no regrets, no matter what the result. Um, that can um, you know, protect us from a lot of inevitable setbacks, subjective and otherwise, that things, things do and happen. But as long as we put in our, our best effort, we can always feel good about it. Um, you mentioned preparation. I, I, I'm very interested in this, obviously, given the title of our of our show here, um, talk to me about you know the days, the hours, the minutes before a really big performance. What what did you do mentally, in particular, to to prepare for this big moment of a big stage? Yeah, so I think mental preparation in general is obviously incredibly important. And I think you can think about it in a couple of ways. One is how you talk to yourself. And then the other is the sort of mental practice that you can do. And that's usually in the form of visualization. So positive self-talk, uh, which is ideally how you talk to yourself, uh, is basically the idea that it's just, first of all, being aware of what you're saying to yourself throughout the day or throughout your uh, practice that you're, you're working on. And then within that, there are a couple of things you can think about. So one is just, obviously, are you being encouraging to yourself? Are you saying things like that sucked? Or are you saying things like, good job, you'll get it better the next time, you know, something kind of being that like supportive parent uh, to yourself. Um, when, when you talk to yourself. So that's, that's one part of it. And the other part of it is really putting things in the context of a positive action. And so the best sort of example of this is, let's say there's a ledge and people are walking past it and the person standing there says, hey, don't trip over the ledge. You're gonna be thinking about the ledge and you're gonna be thinking about the words don't and trip. So trip is the main action that's now in your mind. And you now have all of these different possible scenarios that could happen where you are more likely to trip on that ledge. Where if you thought about it in the context of step over the ledge and gave your body the exact thing that you want it to do, you drastically minimize what your body is, might do, right? Now, instead of having 50 different possibilities of what I could do, I could jump, I could fall, I could slide. I now have one option, which is to step over the ledge. And so in the context of sport or doing something 
well, it's important to think about, okay, am I saying to myself, don't do a certain thing? Or am I really telling myself the exact action that I want to have? So with my sport, um, it was things like, instead of saying, don't, don't shake in a handstand or don't fall, um, really giving myself that, okay, well, what is the, the positive action that I want to have happen here? Maybe that's really pushing down through my arm, um, breathing steadily, um, things like that. So that's the self-talk piece. And the other piece is visualization. So that's, we, we hear, heard this a million times. It's, you know, imagining the scenario that you want to have happen. And obviously adding as much detail to that as possible is really helpful. You know, who's going to be there, what, what it might sound like. So I would always try to look at the venue ahead of time, pictures online, see where, what it might look like. And then once I got there, I would make sure I really looked at the venue, where are all the lights that might be distracting, um, where are the judges going to be, uh, what eye level are they at? And I would incorporate all of those things into my visualization leading up to the event. And uh, one piece of visualization that's important to recognize is if you are in first person or in third person. So first person visualization would be seeing it through my own eyes. Um, I'm in my body, I'm looking out and what am I seeing? What am I feeling? Third person visualization would be you're an outside audience member and you're watching yourself. So I'm going to, you know, be watching myself perform this trick, watching myself on this stage. Um, neither one is necessarily bad, but what I found in my own practice was that if I switched between first person and third person on a trick, usually it would happen in the middle of a trick, uh, usually the scariest part, that would be sort of a clue for me that I have a bit of a mental block there, something I really need to work on. So I would really focus on making sure that I could visualize fully in third, in first person, the entire trick for the entire routine, and then also in third person. Um, and I felt like that really kind of strengthened the practice for me. Um, so that's one thing, that's something I still use today. Um, probably not to the same extreme, but, uh, I do like to kind of envisions um, how I might feel. And I think one thing that really helps me is thinking about how I might feel after I do something, because a lot of times with these pursuits of things that are uh, difficult, the steps along the way aren't that fun. And so if you can think about how you're going to feel after doing something and kind of, it's going to feel so good. I'm going to feel that endorphin release or that dopamine release. Um, it helps give you the motivation to actually do the less fun parts of, of whatever you need to do. Um, so that's kind of an overview of visualization. And then one thing that I think I did that maybe was a little bit different is that I like to combine the two. So when I would visualize my performances, I would also use the positive self-talk within that. So every time I would visualize a certain trick, I had certain words and actions that were associated with that. So I knew from the second I stepped on the floor until the second I got off exactly what I was going to be saying to myself through the entire performance, because I'd visualized it ahead of time. And through that visualization, I'd also talk to myself uh, and said exactly, okay, I want all of these specific things said so that I remember to do them. Uh, when I'm actually in that really high pressure situation, you hear all the time of people freezing up or forgetting to do something when they got up there. And I think that was how I kind of anchored myself through where I knew I wasn't going to freak out in the middle of the routine and be like, oh my gosh, Kristen, what are you doing? I, I had specific things to tell myself. And I even <laughs> took it as far as before my bigger competitions, like uh, world championships, I would actually write myself a letter a few weeks before, and it would be all of the kind of encouraging things that I would want to hear in those moments of self-doubt, which tend to happen right before you step out into the, the major event. So it could be public speaking, whatever it is for you, Those, that self-doubt, you're feeling good, you've prepared, whatever. 
And then it's like right before is when that doubt starts creeping in and you're like, oh my gosh, what if I trip? What if I mess up? What if all of these, you know, all of these negative scenarios that could happen. And so for me to solve for that, I would write myself this letter and whenever throughout the week, um, I would keep it in my, my, the pocket of my, uh, team USA warmups. And, um, whenever I would feel that self-doubt, I would just take it out and I would read it. And so by the end of our, our training weeks, I would have here in like a kiss and cry, um, or not a kiss and cry, sorry, like the green room, which is kind of like a holding area before you go out. Um, and there's not a lot of space to kind of move around. So that's t- tended to be for me where the nerves would creep in. And so I would really just um, repeat that letter to myself over and over in my head. And it basically just helped me stay exactly in that mindset that I wanted to be feeling encouraged, feeling like, okay, I've done everything that i needed to do. I'm as prepared as I can be. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to have fun. Um, and you know, just whatever I wanted to say. Um, so that sort of was my approach to the mental side of sport. Mind blowing. Uh, that's just, it's so profound. I, I want to just take a moment to unpack some of what you said, because I think it's, it's so well-formed and so transferable. Uh, you know, first I'm thinking about things like a habit, the question is, how are you going to feel afterwards? I think this applies to any decision, Mm -hmm. something as simple as, all right, I'm going to the gym rather than thinking about how it's going to be when I'm doing, you know, lifting that weight, doing the thing that I'd rather not versus like that feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction after when you're, when you're walking out. And that generally helps us to make much better decisions if we imagine how we feel about this decision, this action after the fact. Uh, I love this concept of the mental anchor. That, that's the common thing is we do this preparation and then we show up uh, for the game and it doesn't transfer, we freeze up. So having these anchors that can bring us back into that moment, remind us of why we're there. And the, how you put it is so apt is that it all starts with awareness. So an awareness of the way that we're talking to ourselves, that through our language, this affects our thought, which obviously affects our action. So what are you reinforcing? If you're re-encouraging good behavior, that behavior will repeat. And I I think of this dichotomy of approach avoid. A lot of psychology tells us it's like pain and pleasure, approach avoid. And when you're thinking about negative scenarios, it automatically activates this avoidance mindset. Uh, We see this a lot in poker. There's a lot of elements that are outside of our control. So we're playing to the river card and there's cards that are really bad for our hand. And a tendency, myself included, then there is like rooting against that car, like, please no ace, please no ace, please no ace. And the ace comes and this narrative automatically begins of like, oh, another ace, it always happens to me. Like one of these times, everything's gonna line up and they're gonna see who the best player is. And the way that I like to think about it is every card, every street, Every act is the opportunity to make the perfect decision, that there's no good or bad things that could happen. These are all opportunities to make the right decision off of that. So you talk about this visualization, incorporating all the elements into the venue to reduce surprise, because every surprise is a decision point. And some of those decision points might take you down the path of, oh, well, I could have done well, but that light was in my eyes, right? Inserting these excuses for I'm not going to do everything versus this mindset of, okay, I've done everything I've can, I can. I've translated everything this to the arena. Now it's just up to the judges. And so I, there's so much that you said there. I think that's like very subtle in terms of mindset, but that it has such a big impact on a day-to-day basis in reinforcing the things we want to do and showing up ready to perform. So yeah, thank you. That was one of the best illustrations I've heard. Oh, thank you. Well, one thing that I I love about you said is talking about, you know, when when you get something that you don't want, like you get that ace card. And I think one of my kind of hacks for that was 
to tell myself that I was really good in those situations. Um, and it's exactly what you said about reinforcement. So we all, our, our brains are wired to put patterns together. So it's like you said, if you get the ACE card and you're like, oh, this always happens to me, whatever, you've now created this narrative and this pattern, your, your mind has picked up, okay, I always get these ACE cards and this always happens to me specifically. And if you took that and turned it around and said, I'm, I do my best when I get dealt this negative hand, this is my time to shine, this is my time to think creatively, your brain starts creating a new narrative of like, I am great in these um, challenging situations. And so my example of this is I, I would always have a coach that would say, do one more, one more of these, one more rep, one more whatever. And if you messed up on the one more, you'd have to do another one. You'd have to do another one more. And it's always a scary trick, right? It's like something you don't want to do more times because it's terrifying. So I would always tell myself, okay, like, Every time he would say one more, I'd be like, I am the best at one more. Like I rarely mess up one more. So I'm great at this. Um, and actually I wouldn't say that I rarely mess up because I would have said the words mess up, right? Which was not, not something I would do. So I would just say, I am great at one more. And I would do the one more and it would go well and I wouldn't have to do another one. Um, or I would mess up, but I would be like, well, that was an anomaly. Like, I am actually great at one more and this one more, I'm going to show myself why I'm great at them. And I would do it and it would reinforce the pattern. So really like, I think one thing, we have so much control in those situations over our mind and our narrative. Um, and it's really so much of it is just in how you frame it um, and choosing the pattern that you want to create. Um, and that's one thing I use to this day is like, you know, I'll just say to myself, like, I'm great under pressure and, um, anything that happens that's, that's not great is just, well, that was a learning experience and that's going to make me great the next time. Um, and I see those things as anomalies rather than the norm. So, um, yeah, I, I love what you said there. Yeah. The, the brain is really good at completing the pattern. So the narrative that we create almost becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. So I think that the dual power of what you said around, I'm really good at this, is that one, you, you bring yourself up to it. It's like, hey, this is what I've been training for. This is like, this is the moment. But also it, it flips an adverse circumstance into a relative advantage. Because I've trained for this, because I'm ready for it, we're all in the same playing field. This is another source of opportunity for me to differentiate myself. So it's not an adverse condition. It's it can be a positive because I know how to deal with this. I know I know how to make the most of it, and that these subtle differences in framing have a huge difference. It's something that I like to say a lot: is that there's no such thing as failures, but only lessons. And I think that that is another powerful aspect of what you talk about in terms of um, you know creating creating a positive narrative, reinforcing, um, encouraging yourself is that you create a circumstance and that you can stick with something for long enough to become really good at it. I imagine that a challenge with a training schedule that I imagine is just can be really grueling at times is just the fortitude to stick with it. And to, to frame these actions in a narrative that everything I'm doing is towards a higher purpose. Uh, what what's, what yeah. was your training regimen like? Like what, what, what's like a typical day when you were like gearing up for a big event? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I'll definitely walk you through that. But yeah. I, I want to touch on one part of this that I think is also really important to recognize is yes, we can always change our thoughts and we can frame, reframe experiences into being something more positive. But I think a trap that we can get into and especially high performers can get into is reframing an experience as a positive that probably shouldn't be reframed as positive. And the lesson should be, you know, I'm not going to do that again, rather than well, that was okay. I survived it. And I could do that again. I could suffer through that again. Um, and I think that 
that can create a cycle where we don't necessarily recognize situations that we shouldn't be in. Um, and we end up putting ourselves in more discomfort than we should be, whether that's pain, whether that's psychological abuse, whatever. And I think that can translate into relationships and situations in the future that a lot of elite level performers end up in because they're so used to such a high level of discomfort and being able to, to sort of make that a positive. So I think there's definitely something to watch out for there. And, um, you know, I, I don't subscribe to the idea that we should always compartmentalize and always sort of shove down at the true feeling of something, um, in order to perform all. And when we talk about emotional regulation, which is so key in high performance, um, it really needs to be about fully processing an emotion that comes up, fully feeling whatever that thing is and, and processing it properly um, rather than just shutting those things off and saying, well, well, I can find the positive in this. You know, that's, that's not always helpful in the long term. So I just want to make sure I, I put that out there. Yeah, I think that's a really important point is the separation between the performance and what happens after the performance. I think of it as like a, you're you're fully confident doing everything you can to be present when you're there, but there needs to be time to process and even to grieve afterwards to take in, things into account. It can't be just, oh, everything was great. Everything is awesome. We made it through that sort of thing. There, there actually is times that uh it can that can go too far so there's a, there's a there's a double-edged sword to to all of this it's like the people 100%. who are the highest performers can tend to have an all or nothing mindset which is great when things are going well but definitely can backfire and turn in on itself when things are not going so well there's there's exactly. always a other side Exactly. And I think that's something that I'm so grateful is coming into more of the public conversation um, with Simone Biles pulling out of the Olympics, with Naomi Osaka not competing, uh, with The Weight of Gold, the documentary that came out on HBO, which I highly recommend watching if you haven't yet, um, which has Michael Phelps, Ryan Lochte, Bodie Miller, all talking about their mental health experiences in sport. Um, and so I I think it's something that really does need to be top of mind um, that performance is not performing um, no matter what is not the mindset that we should have, that we are human we have a full spectrum of emotion and experience and those things need to be processed and honored um, and not just at the expense of, of success. It's not worth sacrificing everything, including your health and mental health um, to achieve performance. I wanna ask about the, the team dynamic actually. So you performed as a mixed pair. I know when you were world champion is with uh, Michael Rodriguez, how does performing as a pair differ from preparing as, um, as a solo, as a, as a single performer? How do you guys, stay in sync what is what does that look like yeah so um a mixed pair is basically like a a, a pair figure skating duo where um, a male and a female performing together um and actually i would say that's one of the most interesting things about my sport and probably the best part of my experience is that everything that i achieved was also what someone else achieved my success our successes and failures were always shared um, and I think that a lot of what I learned in that scenario is what I continue to take into my work today, um, which is that it's really important to have the person, first of all, making sure that you're relying on someone who's reliable, right? Um, I think sometimes we expect a lot of people who, that, that, and are frustrated by when they can't live up to that standard, um, but they couldn't have to begin with. And so I was really fortunate in my partnership where I had an incredible partner who fully rose to the challenge. Um, and we both had really implicit trust in each other to do our separate jobs. So we both had very different responsibilities, um, but we both had complete trust in each other to accomplish 
that responsibility to the best of our ability every time. And I think that that's something that we were not able to find in other partnerships um, and is incredibly powerful because it means that all of the mental space that you're using, that all of your mental capacity is going towards my own job and the things that I need to do. And none of it is going towards, gosh, I hope that they do their job. Gosh, I hope they don't, you know, they, they do this or that. It's, I didn't ever have to worry about any of that. I was able to fully just focus on what I needed to do, which is a huge blessing. And if you can find that in a partnership in business or in life, I think that that can be incredibly powerful. So you and Michael are world champions. Mm -hmm. how, how does that feel? Uh, when you, after you guys performed, was, was that a surprise after the scoring or did you feel it that you, that this was a championship performance? Oh gosh. I mean, it's always a surprise because it's a subjectively judged sport, but, um, I definitely felt like we were as prepared as we could have been. And we, we knew that we'd done as much as we possibly could have done, um, to be there. And also in that moment, um, the crazy thing about accomplishing your childhood dream is that it is very bittersweet. Um, and I think that this is true of accomplishing any major goal. Um, and I've heard this over and over again from other people who've accomplished their childhood dreams, which is, um, there are songs written about it actually, like it's a long, long way to the top. And then when you get there, you're like, why, wait, what? <laughs> I, I've now done this, but now what do I do next? Because really you are waking up every day for this goal that seemed so far away. And once you've done that, it's sort of like, well, what do I wake up for now? And in our case, we were very young. And so, you know, I was 18 when I won world championships. So I, it's sort of like, well, is my greatest accomplishment now behind me? And I think that this comes from anybody who's had some kind of breakout success. Um, it's like, well, what do I do next? What, how does my, how do, how do I motivate myself now? I've only ever wanted one thing and now I have it. And is it everything that I hoped it would be? Usually it's not, you know, um, it's, it, it provides some, some perks <laughs> um, and it, it's wonderful to have actually accomplished something, but it, it's never, it's never everything that you wanted it to be. And um, it, it's not like, I think we spend a lot of time thinking, okay, I will be happy when I accomplish X, Y, or Z. Um, but that the happiness is fleeting there. So uh, it's really more about, you know, I, I guess that's why they say it's always about the journey. How did you find that your motivation changed after achieving this childhood dream? You had driven yourself so hard to get to this place that you thought maybe this is, this is it. Um, you know, what, what was next for you? Yeah, gosh. Um, well, I definitely spent a few weeks, you know, riding high off of the accomplishment and en enjoying that. Um, but then it really sunk in. And I think there can be a lot of depression after accomplishing something um, major where you, you just really don't know what to do with yourself. I was fortunate that, um, within a couple of weeks, I had a job offer. I moved to Vegas to perform a Cirque du Soleil and I ended up not really having to make a major transition at that point. Um, it was, you know, the, the transition of competing to moving to a new place and performing, which was difficult in its own way, but uh, it wasn't, you know, leaving my sport behind. Um, so I, I, I didn't have to think too hard about it then. Um, I think my major transition really came when I got injured several years later and had to fully leave that part of my life behind and, and do something completely different. So, so first moving to Vegas, eventually to Broadway, performing in Viva Elvis, I mean, with incredible team at Cirque du Soleil, uh, it take us backstage. What, what was it like to work with all of these 
talented performance. I imagine this was this was a bit of the familiar, but also quite different from your experiences before. Yeah, um, the wonderful thing about performing is that you kind of get, my favorite part about uh, my sport was always competing. Um, I loved kind of the, the rush and getting to perform. And so for me, it was like, I got to do that every single day, but without the judging. So I, being on stage for me was such a joy. Um, I found so much motivation and thinking about for every single member of the audience, it was their first time having this experience. Um, and you want to make it as memorable as possible for them. Um, and so it just brings that fresh energy every single night. Um, and so performing was really just an incredibly fun experience for me. Um, backstage is incredible. Cirque du Soleil is, is a, just an amazing company. They take incredible care of their athletes um, and their performers. And the stage hands and everybody who works behind the scenes, there, there are three times as many people work off stage than on stage and they work like clockwork. It is incredible. The preparation, the synergy that's happening behind the scenes. I think sometimes it's more exciting to watch a show from backstage than it is to watch what's actually happening on stage because you have these incredible 90 ton set pieces that are moving in and out hydraulic lifts, um, costume changes, all kinds of things happening. Um, and everyone is so incredibly coordinated and there are contingency plans for everything. So the response that I was able to witness of, of someone getting injured on stage and they're able to get them uh, safely out within two minutes of that happening. And it's like the audience almost never even knew. Um, it's just, yeah, it was an incredible company to work for. and. Um, I really, uh, yeah, it, it's just incredible, the coordination. So talk about the show backstage. Uh, so only having the benefit of seeing it from the audience seats, what, what's something that you saw in these shows that someone in the audience would never guess? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, well, we used to play games sometimes, um, where like there, there would be sort of like tag that would happen, um, where you try to, you could only tag people on stage. So like games like that, that we would play, um, people would make faces and their, their backs are to the audience at each other, um, leave little things around backstage for people to find, play pranks, all of, you know, you, you try to see how late you could leave your dressing room and still make it on stage in time. <laughs> um, so these like mad dashes to the stage. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there are a lot of things that performers do to keep themselves entertained. Oh, I guess one thing that I think is really interesting is that everyone performing in Cirque du Soleil is really only performing at about 75% of their actual capacity. So the amazing thing about being backstage and in the training rooms is that you'll see these people do things that are way crazier than what you would see actually on stage, because that's actually the top of what they're capable of. Because at Cirque, we perform 10 shows a week. At Broadway, it's eight shows a week. So you have to do things that you know you can do safely every single night without fail. Very And, and Cirque's shows are incredibly consistent. You rarely ever see any mistakes. So you, in order to perform at that level of consistency, you have to do things that are really, you can do in your sleep. Um, so to think that every incredible thing that you see that happens on stage, um, is something that that person can pretty much do in their sleep, um, I think is amazing. And so the stuff that I got to witness backstage of just these incredible feats of athleticism, um, I will never forget. And something that I'm really interested in is I know you do some some teaching of gymnastics. You you work with students, young and old. You work with many celebrities, with stunt people. H how do you teach something 
like gymnastics? Like where, where do you start? Oh gosh. <laughs> well, I think that, I think for me, teaching is really about a, a deep empathy for whoever that person is and what their goals are, what they want to learn. Um, and then facilitating that for them, uh, to discover it however they want to. And that, that's a big lesson I've learned from my parents. Both my parents are teachers. My mom is an art teacher. My dad taught skiing and windsurfing. Um, and so they, especially my dad would talk about this idea of guided discovery. And that's sort of where you, you lead the person to uh, discover the skill and kind of have that aha moment themselves rather than saying like, oh, you need to do X, Y, and Z, now go do it. It's like, well, okay, that, that one was off in these ways. What, what do you think might fix it? And allowing them to come to that conclusion themselves. And then they get that little rush of dopamine of like, oh, I figured it out and now I get to go do it. And that makes it stick so much uh, deeper for that person. Um, and I think what I've loved about working with all different types of people from uh, professional gamers um, who have no athletic experience at all um, <laughs> to, uh, to, you know, uh, athletes with a lot of experience um, is that it's great to just see someone for exactly where they're at and help them with just whatever that little next step is for, for what they want to learn and see them have that aha moment themselves. Um, and that's really rewarding. So let's say, for example, uh, someone's name was Chris and he was a former professional <laughs> gamer and he was coming to you for his first ever uh, gymnastics lesson. Um, where, where would you start with him? Gosh, well... <laughs> I would probably refer you to someone who is a better teacher than I am for that stage. I think, uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of teaching um, over the years, but uh, there are incredible coaches out there. And I would not say that coaching is the thing that I'm best at. Um, I, I love teaching adults, especially who just maybe want to learn how to do a handstand or, or, you know, they have a specific goal. They want to become more flexible or something like that. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, honestly, I would probably refer you to somewhere else, to someone else, um, unless you said, okay, I have this really specific goal. I want to, you know, learn how to do the splits or, um, learn how to do a cartwheel, then I, I could probably start you off with something. Yeah, I, I think that's a common commonality as far as learning any new skill is to have a learning objective, something specific that you can do that you can't do already. And that way, being able to work backwards from that and, and track progress versus like, I'd like to be good at gymnastics. Well, what does what does good <laughs> mean for you? What type of situations are you thinking about practicing? Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And that brings up another great point. Um, you know, goal setting is obviously incredibly important. And I think um, one way you can really always kind of keep your head in the game is setting those tight, we call them micro goals. So just like what's like a tiny little thing that you can set your mark on and accomplish today. Maybe that's just doing one extra rep um, that you haven't been able to do before in the gym or, um, you know, shaving half a second off of your, your mile time or whatever it is that you, you feel like you can accomplish um, that fit within your, your medium goals and then your sort of macro goals. Um, so I, yeah, I love that you brought that up. It's definitely a commonality that we've seen here is that people who go on to accomplish many things, uh, you know, put out a award-winning album, become world champion, sell their company. It's, it's a, long series of small iterative steps and that that's what a lot of what makes life 
satisfying. It gives us a sense of purpose that the small things we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, that we can see the small accumulating input towards our reason for being on this earth, our, our purpose for, for being here. So mm -hmm. thinking about what's that next tiniest action that we can take today to keep moving those long-term goals forward. It's probably not going to be in our email. You brought up something <laughs> that I don't think I've asked about before on this show. So I know that your your brother was a was an acrobatic gymnast as well. You've mentioned a couple times some of the um, the words of wisdom your father has shared for, with you. Seems like a really good mentor. That both of your parents were teachers. You know, art, skiing, surfing. What advice would you have for a parent of a child who? let's say is seven or maybe going on 11 and wants to be a top performer in their sport? How can a parent bring out the best in their child without pushing them too hard? That's a great question. Um, well, yeah, so my brother did start off in acrobatic gymnastics. He went on to become an incredible dancer um, and is now a, a an actor um, oh, and actually is been in, in many popular shows. So um, <laughs> he, he's doing great. Um, but, and I always love to give him a little shout out. Um, <laughs> go Kyle. Um, but I, yeah, I think, you know, I think parents can obviously get hyper involved and have their own goals for their children. And I think it's important that parents don't put their their goals onto their children and let their children explore what they want to explore. Um, I was lucky that my parents didn't push me to do anything that I didn't want to do. Um, although I actually wish that, I, I think we were all sort of complicit in um, the trauma and abuse that occurs in elite level training. Um, and we all sort of thought of it as something that you just have to do, right? It's like, we were all like, well, you need Russian coaches and, and you need, um, not, not that they're always Russian, but, um, Eastern Bloc training has its own, I, you know, sort of stereotypical things that happen, um, that I was definitely subject to, but I think we all kind of, you know, even in the books that I read, I, I read a lot of biographies of other athletes and saw that, okay, well, this is the type of training that they're in as well. So it must be okay. Um, and so we all sort of subscribe to this idea that, okay, I'm coming home crying every day, but that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, a uh, part of the process, you know? Um, and I don't fault my parents at all for that, but, um, I think it's important for parents to also recognize when, um, and, and there's so much more information out there now, you know, to, it's important to kind of strike that balance between not being too involved that you're pushing your kid to accomplish something that they don't necessarily want, but also being involved enough to know what's really happening. Um, and whether maybe there are things that are inappropriate going on, um, and maybe a level of training that isn't actually psychologically healthy. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, would I put my kid or, or in the gymnastics, are they going to be, you know, a world champion athlete as well. And it's like, I'd really rather they didn't, you know, <laughs> I'd rather they explore things and, and really focus on having great relationships and building friendships and building those soft skills that are really going to bring them true success and happiness um, over just accomplishing something that looks good on paper. I think that's a good um, transition to to your second transition and this larger mission of finding lasting health and happiness. So you were performing uh, in Pippin on Broadway, and during a performance, you injured your back. And first, you weren't quite sure how serious it was, but through a series of, I think, 10 surgeries to try to repair the damage. I can only imagine that that pain and, and just the unknown of, of what was going on at that moment. You decided that 
this might be the end for your performing career that you might never step foot on stage again um talk to us about that what what was going through your mind you know walking away from the thing that you identified as that you defined yourself as and thinking that perhaps you'd have to walk away from that yeah i i i got injured in 2014 um it was a a big fall basically um and basically a high high impact injury um but yeah we didn't really know i we thought it was you know i dislocated some ribs i had whiplash i thought i'd recover um and be back on stage, you know, in six weeks, but that's not what ended up happening. So it, it took a while to unpack. It wasn't a common injury. I ended up with really severe chronic pain um, that I had for the last seven years. And I actually ended up forming a bone spur in my spinal cord. Um, so it caused a lot of nerve damage um, and nerve pain that um, I just recently actually had surgery for and in, in the process of recovering from now. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that I'll have lasting relief from that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it was a, a major transition to sort of come to terms with, okay, what I've been doing and what, how I've been you know, supporting myself for as long as I can remember is, is now gone and I, I don't have that option anymore. Um, and so, you know, I'm now, I was 23. And it's kind of like, I have to figure out what I do, what I do next. What do I, what do I care about? What do I want? Um, and then on top of that, for me, I, I didn't have the outlet of being able to be active. Um, I don't know. I was also constantly dealing with a pretty high level of pain day to day. So that really affected what I was able to do activity wise. So um, I ended up going back to school and I was really fortunate that a wonderful family um, helped me through the process of, of getting back on my feet and figuring out, you know, what college looked like and uh, how to navigate that whole process and you know, what classes to take, what the requirements were and all of that. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful that I had, I had that support because it can be a time when you know, when someone's achieved a certain level of success in one thing, people assume that it's going to be fairly easy for them to transition into the next thing. And they have a certain level of sense of fortitude, whatever. But um, the reality is that it's incredibly difficult. And a lot of that mental fortitude is sort of wrapped up in identifying really strongly with this one thing that gave you success and confidence. And when you don't have that, you also don't have your confidence because it was tied into that first thing. So figuring out, okay, well, if I, if I don't have that, who am I, what am I good at? Um, and you know, will people accept me or like me if I'm doing something totally different? And then also the pressure of okay, I'm the best in the world at this one thing. Um, I have that title of world champion. And so everyone expects you to be the best at whatever you do next. And really quickly, it's like, you should be great at everything you do. Um, and it's like, well, that may not be the case. And you may not even want to, right? You might not even feel like that level of passion for something else. Or um, you, know, you might just want to have the space to be a beginner to explore um, uh, you might want to be kind of like a normal person for a while, you know, and whatever that is. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I think that it, it can be incredibly challenging to go through that. And, um, I'm also grateful that a lot of organizations are starting, sporting organizations are starting to recognize that that transition is really difficult. And, because there's not that normal kind of progression from sport to college or from, sorry, high school to college to being out on your own, um, that, that path looks different and requires more support. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that other organizations are starting to take that more seriously. That, that resonates so much. Um, I mean, I, I've definitely experienced 
my version of that. Um, so in the poker world, when we had Black Friday, so you know, no longer able to play poker from the U.S., that felt like a forced retirement at the top of my career, where I, was, I felt you know, recognized as being one of the top players. And this question of, oh, well, if I don't have poker, what do I have? Who, who am I really? And uh, this desire to be normal and just to do things for their own sake it was, it was very difficult to explain to others. Um, after I stopped playing poker, I, I started traveling and I went from kind of living the high life of, you know, being on TV and doing all the mansion and travel to staying in hostel dorms and telling everyone, you know, some days that I'm a student or some days, you know, I'm working marketing in a company and just wanting to kind of fade into the background because I, I was so uncertain with who I was and it seemed silly to talk about the thing that I once did. And, and friend, I, friends would be there and they say like, oh, he, he shut up. He's like one of these great poker players. Like, why, why don't you tell them about it? Like, well, you know, maybe I don't want to be that, that person today. So it was, it was really, it's just a, the transition is always longer and it's never quite a straight line. So I, I agree. I think it's really important to, to have the support of friends, family, organizations to find who you want to be and to have a sense of self that is disconnected from what we do. I think a lot of this is societally enforced of wanting to put someone in a box by their profession when we are all so much more than that and it really starts with the way that we see ourselves and as you put earlier so apt um you know what behavior we we encourage and reward so you know something that's been a thread through this conversation is the challenges that even high performers can have with mental health where the challenge of having such a high standard is that you fall short of that standard so often you know, what, what have you learned over the years, both through your performance and your time post-athlete, post-performer about positive mental health? Well, I guess one is kind of the cliche that we've all heard, which is, you know, the sooner you can get professional help, the better. Um, and I think that we, as high performers, and we are also considered people who have a lot of mental strength and mental control and that we can sort of solve all of our problems ourselves. Um, and so I definitely fell into that trap. It took me a really long time to want to seek help because I thought that, well, I can read, you know, I can read about it. I can learn from other people. Um, I don't, I don't need, you know, to actually pay someone to sit and work through my mind with me. Um, but I think that everyone, no matter what, um, what place they're at in life can benefit from that. And I know that's really a, being a broken record because we hear that all over the place. Um, and I would have probably rolled my eyes at somebody saying that a few years ago. Um, but here I am in, in this seat, uh, saying that today. So, um, yeah, I, I think getting the help to just sort of work through, okay, why, what were my motivations then? What were the things that happened to me? How do I process emotion in this new, new way? How have my past experiences affected how I see the world now? Um, all of those things are really helpful to work through with someone else. And it's not having, I think the mistake that I made is I thought I didn't want anyone else telling me what I should think or do. Um, but that's not really what it is. It's really someone kind of acting as a mirror and just giving you the space to explore that yourself, uh, which is really helpful. Um, so, um, yeah, I definitely think that getting help is really important for positive mental health. Um, really putting your relationships first, which I think in our culture, we tend to put work first. Um, we tend to put career accomplishments first. Um, and those are the things that get sacrificed. Uh, or relationships are the things that get sacrificed along the way. Um, and then when you lose your, your career, your sport, 
uh, or something happens to you, like a major injury or health issue, um, you realize like, wow, I didn't nurture those relationships probably in the way I needed to, to have the support system that I need now. Um, so I think for me really putting that first and like, okay, how do I relate to people now in this new capacity? Um, what things are important, um, has been really positive for me. Um, and then also connecting with the things that, um, I loved as a child, you know, um, exploring new interests, all of those things I think are, are really helpful. So talk to us about your, your mission, your work today. I, you mentioned your, your founder of the Acrobatic Gymnastics Foundation. You know, what, what are you working towards these days? Yeah, so I have a, a wonderful small foundation, which is my way of, of staying connected with the sport. And we provide grants to athletes um, who have financial need um, to help them compete because it's an expensive sport. Um, and then I'm also a chair of the National Gymnastics Foundation, um, which exists to support the athletes in the, the broader sport of gymnastics. Um, and uh, I'm currently, I, I worked as a startup investor um, for the last year, which I was really passionate about bringing more funding to female and minority founders. Um, the crazy statistic is that only 2% of all venture capital funding goes to companies with female founders, um, which uh, is incredibly small. So, um, and then minority founders, even less than that. So, um, so that's something I've been really, really passionate about. Um, and then this year I moved towards uh, being on the building side. So I'm uh, working with a startup uh, that's work that's uh, basically in compliance tech and we are um, working to increase transparency in the food system. Um, so I'm, I've really enjoyed um, working with companies getting started. I think there are a lot of parallels between entrepreneurs and athletes um, and so I feel like I can kind of bring, <laughs> bring a level of empathy and compassion um, to founders um, and so that's been really re rewarding for me. Thank you so much, Kristen. This has been a, a really powerful and enlightening conversation. I, I really, um, you know, honor and respect not only the the dedication that you've had to your practice, but your dedication to to your mission um, for for athletes, for founders, and now for food. Um, if there's someone out there who this conversation resonated, you know, perhaps an athlete who could be interested in applying for a grant, someone who's working to help underrepresented founders get fine funding, someone who holds that key to adding transparency to the food industry, how would you recommend they, they get in touch? Um, well, I have a, a website, it's kristenallen.co. Um, and there's a contact form on there. I, it's not very up to date, but it is a way of connecting with me. Um, and then LinkedIn is another great way to connect with me. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions and, and, um, and, and just hear about um, other people's experience. So yeah, I'm definitely happy to talk to anyone who would like to talk. Well, thank you all for those who made it this far for joining us for another enlightening episode of Forcing Function Hour. Uh, here at Forcing Function, we teach performance architecture to a select group of 12 executives and investors in meaningful companies. Coming up this fall, we have the launch of our fourth cohort of team performance training, where I teach my complete performance system. If you're ready to raise your game, download my peak performance workbook for free at experimentwithoutlimits.com. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kristen. See you all again Thank soon. Thank you so much for having me.